Well, good morning. Man, it's great to see you today. So glad that, that you're here. Um, hey, next, starting next week, we'll start a new series on Moses. And uh, for about the month of June, we'll be looking at Moses. And you'd be surprised how much Moses is like most of us today. And uh, look, look forward to, to sharing with you as we uh, look at a series called Wild Life. And he lived a wild life. He, he certainly did. Today, we're, we're going to continue and finish up our uh, relationship series or family series, whatever you want to call it, and talk about life management. And what, is life, what does that mean, life management? And just real, real basic stuff here. You know, I believe the key to, to your life is relationship. That a life is lived best in relationship, always is. You can't live in isolation, or you shouldn't live in isolation. If you live in isolation, you live a miserable life. You, you live a life that is, that is really declining. But, but if you're going to live a life that is growing and strengthening, it's got to be lived in relationship. That's why the Bible says, as, as we relate to one another, that we're like iron. We sharpen one another. Proverbs talks about that. And so as, as we relate to each other, we sharpen one another. And so I pray that, that you do. Let me just explain it this way. Uh, there, there was a woman who lost her husband. husband. She went down to the uh, uh, newspaper and met with the editor and said, I need to... Uh, put an obituary in for my husband. He died yesterday. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. said, what, what would you like the obituary to say? And said, well, uh, I'm not real sure. He said, how much did it cost? I said, well, it's 50 cents a word. She said, okay, I'll tell you what, put this in. Just put um, Fred Brown died. And he said, well, ma'am, you know, I understand the brevity of that and what you're looking for, but you, there's, a, there's, a ten, there's you know, at least a seven-word minimum. And so, you know, it's 50 cents a word. He said, oh, well, okay, let me think about that. He said, all right, I'll tell you what. For his obituary, put this in. Put Fred Brown died, 2018 pickup for sale. <laughs> now, I would tell you that Mr. and Mrs. Brown didn't have the best of relationships. That, that's what I would think, that they were a couple that there was a lot lacking in their relationship there was a lot that needed to be done in their relationship and you would just say there's just not much here that there's just not much here when it comes to the browns relationship and i believe this that there comes a point in everyone's life where when you give your life to christ that relationship begins but that relationship that relationship has to grow has to become, become stronger and it becomes stronger because we do life together we do life together. That, that's why you have Sunday morning Bible study, not just so you can do, do, go do a Bible study, but so you can come together, rub shoulders, and do life together and get stronger, and you get stronger under the headship of Jesus Christ. Also, we believe this, that if you're going to do life together, the best way to do life together is to build your life on the, on the foundation of Jesus Christ and God's Word. That your fa the foundation for your life is built on God's Word and in relationship with one another. That's why we say all the time here that you need to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ, but you also are to love one another. That's why we say we love God, love people. It's a great commandment. And that, that's how we're to live. And so if you don't accept this, if you don't accept God's word as a foundation for your life, you might as well tune me out. Because everything I'm going to say today comes from here. Hopefully every Sunday everything I say comes from here. And it, and it is the foundation for your life. It is what keeps you on solid footing. That's what makes for a strong relationship. Now, when we come to, to, to our life management, we talk about that. I understand my life is not my own. God is the owner of everything, including my life. Everything you have is a gift from God. The very air that you're breathing is a gift from God. The fact that you're alive today is a gift from, is a gift from God. And so, have you ever heard someone say this? Students, has any parent ever, your parents ever said this? I brought you into this world, I take you out of this world. You ever heard that? Has any parent ever said that to your kids? You know, brought you into this world, take, you know, and that's a misnomer. You can't, you can't really say that because uh, God's the one that brought you into this world and God's the one that'll take you out of this world. Yesterday, I did the funeral service for Johnny Curtis, 101 years old, a full life. She was a faithful member. In fact, church, these screens, she paid for those screens. But before screens were, were ever here, the idea was there. She said, you go get the screens, those projectors, put them up. And she paid for them. And so that, that should, she was way ahead of her time. Well, God determined her number of days, said, you have 101 years. And, and we were blessed, and she was a blessing. Well, 
When we talk about management, when we talk about life management, Jesus told a parable. What's a parable? A parable is a modern day story with one spiritual point. That, that's the purpose of a parable. Jesus told these, these stories, and did he make them up? Yes, he did. He just made them up and said, this is a story, but it has a spiritual point for you. One major point. Now, you could have several points spin off from that, but there was one major point he was trying to make. I'm going to give you the end of the story, and then we'll go back and fill the gaps. Here's, here's the end of the story. It's found in Matthew 25. It says, Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I know that you're a harsh man and harvesting crops that you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have had gotten some, some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has ten bags of silver. To those who, who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But to those who do nothing, to those who do nothing, even what little they have is going to be taken away. Now throw this useless servant out into, utter, out into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Strong words. Let's get the back story. Let, let's just say this master, let's just call him a businessman. He has three employees that work for him. And, and you know, when you're, when you're the, uh, the manager of the company, you watch your employees. There are some that just go above and beyond. They do more than is asked. They are the and then some kind of person. And I believe all of us should be, if you're a Christ follower, you should be a person that is and then some. You know, pastor, what can I do? I want to do this, but I'll do this also and then some. That's just kind of how we live. I pray we all live that way. It's called the extra mile living that Jesus taught. Well, when a manager sees that and says, hey, you know, this, this guy's good. Well, in the story, he says, look, uh, you've done so well, I'm going to give you five talents or five bags of silver, let's just say. To the other one, he says, you know, you've done so well, I'm going to give you two talents or two bags of silver. And to the third, he says, well, you know, you're, you're here, you show up on time, you leave on time, but that's about it. Here's your one bag of silver. He said, I'm going to go on an extended trip, and while I'm ext extended trip, I want you to take that, invest that, do with it whatever you want, but when I come back, I just want to see what, what you've done with it. So he leaves on his extended trip. When he comes back, the one with five and the one with two have doubled it. And he, he receives it and says, man, this is fantastic. Enter into my happiness. This is fantastic. Man, you've done, you've done well with what little I've given you. You're, you're going to be blessed with even more. I'm going to give you more responsibility. I'm going to increase your pay. And to the, to the one that gave one, he came to him and he said, what would you do? And he said, well, man, I know you're a hard man. And man, you, you're, you're a difficult man to to work for, and I get that, and so I just want to be faithful to you. I went and dug a hole, and I buried that money. I buried that talent, and uh, man, I knew you were coming back, and so when you came back, I just dug it up, and so here it is. Here's your dirty money. Now, I don't know about you, but if I dig a hole somewhere, and I bury something, and it rains like it did last week, I may not know where that hole was. You, you get what, where I'm coming from? I mean, I, I may just forget, but he didn't forget. He's better than me. He didn't forget. He brought it back, and the master's response was violent. He said, I'm, he said basically, you're fired. You're done. And Jesus said, put him out in utter darkness. In other words, the relationship is severed. We're, we're done. It's a difficult place. What you have in that story are the ABCs of life management. It is that simple. And the outline is A, B, and C. It starts with accountability. Oh, the word we don't like to hear. Accountability. I mean, it's what the story teaches us. It's accountability. The master is going to return, and you're accountable when he returns. It's accountability. The Bible teaches that we are first and foremost accountable to God. And there are several things we can say about that. First thing we can say is our sins have social consequences. You do not sin unto yourself. Every time I sin, I'm in relationship with other people, and every time I sin, I hurt someone else. I don't just hurt me, I hurt someone else. If I sin against my wife, I've not only hurt my wife, I've hurt myself, and then she will hurt me. I mean, I just know how that works. 
right? I mean, that's, that's, that's just how, how it works. It, it just, I, we, we know that. Our sins have social consequences. Every sin hurts someone else, and so our sins have social consequences. Secondly, accountability maximizes your potential. You realize because you're accountable, you understand this is the standard by which I must live, and so I'm going to, be, I'm going to maximize my potential because I know I'm held accountable. I'm going to do this because I know I'm held accountable for it. For example, what is April 15th? Tax day. If the government didn't say, you will pay taxes on April 15th, there's not one person in this room that would pay taxes on April 15th. We would rationalize that away. If, if the government said, you know, it's a good idea if you pay your taxes on April 15th, then we would immediately think, well, it's not that good of an idea. And we would rationalize away why we're not going to pay those taxes uh, on April 15th. No, we know that there is going to be consequences if we don't. You see, it maximizes our potential if not. If I'm playing ball and the coach says, if you don't come to these practices, you will not play, I'm motivated to be at those practices. Maxes my potential. Third, God makes investments in you. Do, do you realize God has given you a talent? God, God has given you ability, and God invests in you, just like this landowner or whoever he was invested in his servants. God invests in you. Who's the giver? God is the giver. Who gives me my life? God's the one that gives me life. Who gives me my ability? God's the one that gives me my ability. So it's my responsibility to, to manage and develop my gifts. Even if I'm a one gifted person, it's my responsibility to develop that gift. But I would dare say almost everyone in this room has many more gifts than one. It's your responsibility to develop those. Why? Because God is making the investment in you. Accountability also says that no one escapes no one escapes accountability. We will all be held accountable. And, and this is where I get nervous. Let, let me read this scripture to you, see if you get as nervous as I do. Matthew 12, 36. And I tell you this, you must give an account, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. Whew. Spoken any idle words lately? I mean, someone gets you so worked up that you said something you wish you hadn't? Yeah. Oh, it gets worse. Uh, Romans 14 says, yes, each of us must give a personal account to God. Personal account to God. Oh, yeah, it gets worse. Hebrews 14, verse 13 says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. You do not escape accountability. We are held accountable by God. That should make you nervous. And when he says every idle word, I've got lots of them. I've got lots of them. I know I don't have much company in the room. I know y'all watch your mouths really well, but I, I don't. I, I don't. And I wish, wish I did. Accountability. No one escapes accountability. We are accountable. So A, accountability. B, boundaries. Boundaries. Oh, man, what do you mean by that? Here's, here's what I mean. Boundaries are, are preset ideas, preset conditions, preset plans that I'm going to obey. And when, I'm, when, I'm, when I come to temptation, I have already decided how I'm going to behave. I've already decided my, my behavior pattern, already decided what I'm going to do. That's why when the, when the two of the servants were given this talent, five and two talents, they immediately had already decided by the boundaries of their lives, this is what I'm going to do with this. The other one had no boundaries, so he just went and hid his money, dug a hole and hid it. Because there was no predetermined idea of this is how I'm going to live. Do you realize God has given you boundaries in your life? Some of those are called the Ten Commandments. You, they're not ten suggestions, they're ten commandments. God has given you, through Jesus' great sermon in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, called the Sermon on the Mount, He's given you, at the beginning of that, the attitudes that we're to have. They're called the B-attitudes. It's how you should be living. I have these attitudes. And, and here's, here's how it works. When I have a, a boundaries in my life, I have these attitudes, I have these commands, so that when the temptation is presented, I already know how I'm going to behave. Because if I don't know that, then when the temptation is presented, then I will fall for it every time. I'll fall flat on my face every time. You see, these boundaries are like guardrails in my life that keep me on path. And if I stay within those boundaries, I'm not going to get outside of that because when I get outside of that, I get hurt. 
It's when I get outside of that, I fail. When I get outside of that, it's when I stumble. But, but, but the boundaries keep me on the road, keep me moving forward. And so there's boundaries in our lives that we just don't step over. The problem is we don't really believe we're held accountable. We don't believe there are boundaries. That we'll make up our own rules. We'll make up our own path and we get hurt every time. The problem with the servant who received one talent was he just didn't have a plan. There are no boundaries in his life. He just did what he wanted, so he did nothing. He did nothing, which brings us to the third, confessional living. Confessional living. You see, good life management depends largely on confessional living. What, what do I mean by that? You see, the time will come when you will give a full confession, when you'll give a full confession. Just a few verses that we'll read beyond what we just read in the story. This is what it says, Matthew 25, verses 30, verse 37. It says, Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And then verse 40, And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And then verse 45, And he will answer, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you're refusing help to me. You see, confessional living, confessional living, let's just call it open book living, open book living. We know we have a God who is faithful and just, forgive us of all of our sin. The Bible says if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just, forgive you, and he will wash you clean and return you to a place of full relationship. We know that. We know that, but I am accountable to God. I live, I live by the boundaries God has placed in my life, and when I mess up, I give full confession for that. It's called confessional living. It's how we are to live. When we blow it, we don't hide it, we own it. And we all blow it, including the guy on the stage. We, we all blow it. And so here, here's how you sum it up. God expects a return on his investment. Make sure you know that. God expects a return on his investment. And immediately when we say that, we begin to rationalize that and say, well, you know, does he just expect 5%? Or, you know, a tithe is 10%. Maybe he expects 10%. I mean, surely he doesn't expect me to double it like the first two. And we just begin to rationalize that away. What does God want from you? What, did, did, God, did, did this master really want them to double that? That's not even the point. The point of the story is this. Make sure you hear it. What God expects of me, what he expects of you is one thing, faithfulness. That's what he expects, is faithfulness. He wants faithfulness from you. He wants faithfulness from me. That's what he expects. And that's what he requires. And he will not bend on that. And it comes through accountability, boundaries, and confessional living. It brings us full circle. You see, the key to a successful life, a successful life management is one thing. It's relationship. Relationship with God and relationship with each other. How we're to live. I have a loving father who knows how to, how to forgive. He also knows how to give. And he loves to give good gifts to his children. He's the owner of my life. He's the owner of everything in my life. And guess what? He's the owner of your life and everything in your life. And he expects you to manage that, that well. And it begins with accountability. It moves to boundaries and confessional living. It follows all the way through. So there's one lesson. Remember, parable has, has one lesson. There's one lesson you need to get from this. And here it is. The stronger the relationship we have with the master, the more daring the disciple. The stronger the relationship you have with the master, the more daring you'll be as his disciple. So how strong is your relationship? Maybe the reason you're not nearly as daring as the first two servants is because the relationship's not that strong. Maybe you need to work on the relationship with, with the master where you become much, much stronger because the deeper my relationship with God, the more confident I will be in my service to God and God is going to expect faithfulness from me. He's going to ex expect me to step out. He's going to expect me to follow him and it's accountability, it's boundaries, and it's confessional living. Follows all the way through. The key to this whole story 
I think, falls down on, the, on that third servant. And it's just so sad. The key to it, he didn't do anything. I mean, he just didn't do anything. He didn't even give an effort to do anything. And he wasn't rebellious. He wasn't angry. He just didn't do anything. I mean, the only thing he did was dig a hole. That's it. He just, he literally didn't do anything. And I know there's an entire world of people who say, well, I'm a good moral person. I, I don't cheat on my husband. I don't cheat on my wife. I drive the speed limit. I don't pad my expense account. And they feel like, man, I'm living a righteous life. Really? I just really don't do anything. I, I almost was going to say here, and I'm glad I didn't, I almost gonna, was going to say that it sounds like a Baptist church member, but I, wouldn't, I don't want to say that, and so I'm not going to say that. I I'm not, don't want to say that. But if I say it, I probably would have said it in the first service and not the second service. Well, certainly not the second service at all. No, not, not ever. What do you do with what God did, what God's given to you? What, what have you done with what God's given to you? Just go hide in the hole? Just do nothing? David Matthews grew up in Vernon, Texas. Anybody here know where Vernon, Texas is? Yeah. Know Vernon, Texas well. I see. Uh, he grew up in Vernon, Texas, and he was 18 years old. Anybody in here 18 years old? They all graduated. There's, there's my new graduate. Congratulations. 18 years old. Man, David had a, he had a girlfriend, he had a job, and he had a car. Three reasons why he said, Dad and Mom, when you go on your two-week vacation family, I ain't going. That's what he said in good Texas English. He said, I'm not going. And they said, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> you forget who the parent is. And he said, no, Mom and Dad, really, I'm 18. I, I, I'm, I'm responsible now. I've graduated. I think I can handle it. And they said, oh, I tell you what, son, you're 18. Well, David's father loved parakeets. He raised parakeets. He had 25 parakeets in, in, in a room that was built especially for these parakeets. They had their own cages. They had their own air conditioning. They, and he trained them. He worked with them. And he said, I'll tell you what, son. He said, you can stay home provided you take care of my parakeets, and all I need you to do is water and feed them every day for the two weeks I'm gone. He said, great, Dad, I'm glad to do that. So they left for two weeks. Man, after two weeks, I mean, can you imagine the freedom? Mom and Dad, no supervision, two whole weeks. 18, I mean, that is pure freedom. They came back after two weeks, and man, David met them at the door, big hugs. Man, he actually was missing them. And so they, they hugged him and came, came in. His dad walked, hugged his son, walked past his son to the room with the parakeets. He walked in, and we came out, and David said, when he came walking out, I became physically nauseous. He said, I hadn't thought or done anything about those parakeets for two weeks. I hadn't fed them. I hadn't watered them. And every one of them were dead. My dad walked out of that room, looked at me, and said, thank you for taking care of my parakeets, and walked on. He said, I have never felt that level of judgment in my life, ever. He said, it wasn't that I, that, that I just rebelled against my dad. It wasn't that I was angry at the parakeets. It, it, it wasn't that, that I was so consumed with myself that I didn't even care. He said, the problem was, I just didn't do anything. I just didn't lift a finger to do anything. And there you have the story that Jesus told. The strongest condemnation comes to the person that literally does nothing does nothing how does that describe you how does that describe you god has gifted you god, god is a loving father who gives good gifts to his children and he says look you're going to be held accountable and i have boundaries for which you live for which you can live and you'll be successful and when you blow it live confessionally just confess that i'll return you to a place of health a place of of good a place of strength and you can be freed to live for me to do for me but the the strongest condemnation is always going to come to the servant who does nothing 
I pray that doesn't describe you. I pray it doesn't describe me. And I pray it doesn't describe this church. I pray we're healthy servants. Would you pray with me? God and fathers, we come now, we come thanking you again for the amazing love and patience you have with us. God, thank you for how you lead us, how you guide us, how you challenge us. God, I pray that we would always seek to live for you in all things. God, we know we, we blow it. We know we fail so many times. But God, I pray we'd never be like that third servant where we just don't do anything. God, let, let us be strengthened where we try. And God, when we blow it, we know we can come to you, we confess that, and, and you, re you restore us, and we thank you. And so God, thank you for, for a loving church that encourages people to try. It gives people room to try. And God, for a loving church that, that says, <laughs> yeah, we blew it, but we know you are here to pick us up, and we do this together in community, and we thank you. But God, as we come to this moment that you call an invitation, or we call an invitation that that you invite us by your spirit to maybe get on the same page with you finally or maybe just move in your direction god help us help us be strong for you truly live for you for it's in christ's name we pray amen